I'm Amy Lang and I'm with Birds and Bees and Kids. I'm a mom, I have a nine-year-old son, and I always imagined that I would be the kind of parent that was really comfortable talking to her kid about sex. I figured I'd be really open and askable and that I would be ready to handle anything that came at me when it came to sexuality. Well, the first time I had an opportunity to talk to my son, I was surprised because I was completely freaked out. I had no idea what to say to him. I didn't know when I should start the conversations with him. I didn't know what topics were appropriate, what wasn't appropriate, and I really panicked. I was shocked because I've been a sexual health educator since I was 22 years old. I've done pregnancy counseling, STI and HIV counseling. I'm really comfortable with this stuff. I've talked to pretty much anybody you can think of about anything related to sexuality. 13-year-old girls, 63-year-old grandmothers, you name it, I've talked to them. I also realized something. I never understood why parents had such a hard time talking to their kids, and I suddenly got it. It is weird, it's uncomfortable, it's challenging, and we don't know how to have these conversations with our kids. I've been a sexual health educator for 20 years, I'm a certified parent educator, and I have a master's degree in applied behavioral science. I'm trained to work with adults. I love to talk about sex, I love to work with adults, and I thought, you know what? The world needs help, parents need help, heck, I needed help, and so I decided to start Birds and Bees and Kids. My mission is to encourage and inspire adults to talk to the kids in their care about sexuality, love, and relationships. So I started Birds and Bees and Kids and Birds and Bees and Kids dot com. So what we're going to talk about today is how to start these conversations with your kids. You'll learn what to say by when, what those conversations should look like. I'll give you some statistics about what teenagers are up to right now in terms of their sexual activity. We'll also spend some time looking at your own personal history learning about sex and also how to clarify your own sexual values. I believe that talking to your kids about your sexual values is one of the most important things you can do for your kids. Now, I know this is really daunting stuff to talk about, but one thing that I think you'll take comfort in is this. The National Campaign to Prevent Teen and Unplanned Pregnancy surveys kids every other year and they ask them, who's your primary influence when it comes to making decisions about dating, relationships, and sex? So you should all be thrilled to know that it's you. Parents are kids' number one influence when it comes to making decisions about sex, followed by themselves, their own morals and beliefs, and then their peers, and then the media and religion. So I think this is really great news because it means that we're impactful. It means they're listening to us. It means they want to hear from us. I also think that it kind of stinks because it means they're listening to us. They want to hear from us. We're impactful. It means we need to step up to the plate and have these conversations with our kids. So one of the things that I do is I teach from a really broad perspective. And that means I'm going to give you a whole lot of information. And some of this information you might not agree with. We have different values, but I believe it's your job to share your values with your kids. And if I give you a little tiny bit of information, there's no place for you to wiggle. If I give you a lot of information, there's more room for you to grow and learn and for you to teach your own kids what's important to you. So I try to keep my conversation politically and religiously neutral because, again, I believe that's your responsibility, not mine. But you may find that I, when I give examples, you're going to hear some of my own values come through. And that's OK, because that's going to give you a stepping off point for developing your own values around sexuality, love, and relationship. My hope is that by the end of this conversation, you're going to feel empowered and encouraged and confident and actually excited about having these conversations with your kids. So I want to start with where we probably don't want our kids to end up. I want you to learn a little bit about what teenagers are up to right now in terms of their sexual activity. Now, these statistics are from the Centers for Disease Control, the National Campaign to Prevent Teen and Unplanned Pregnancy, and the Guttmacher Institute. 
And remember, these are current numbers, and so these numbers actually don't change very much. So I know one of the big questions parents have is, when do kids have sex for the first time? Well, it's 17. It's been 17 for quite a while. So 17, high school, maybe senior year of high school might feel okay. I think most of us would prefer that our children wait until they're in their early 30s, <laughs> but we're probably not gonna get that. So 17. So that kind of will be okay, except when you think about this, which is that the United States has the highest teen pregnancy rate in the industrialized world. Out of 1,000 teenage girls, 72 will become pregnant each year. If we travel to the Netherlands, where they have the lowest teen pregnancy rate in the industrialized world, about 12 girls will become pregnant each year. What's happening in the Netherlands that's not happening here is a couple of different things. First of all, they have a much more open culture about sexuality than we do. Their kids have lots of information from an early age, pragmatic government programs, so everybody knows about pregnancy prevention and HIV prevention. It's not a big secret. And the other thing, too, is that they have easily accessible medical care, so it's easy for teenagers to get birth control and to get their sexual health attended to. And they also have correspondingly low rates of STIs and HIV. Nearly half of all high school students have had sex. About 10% of virgins have had oral sex. And this is a statistic that was actually new to me. And for a teenager, a sexually active teenager who's not using contraception, they have a 90% chance of becoming pregnant within a year. So let's move along to sexually transmitted infections. One in four teenage girls has an STD. Chlamydia, herpes, HPV are among these STDs they have. Boys' STD rates are slightly lower. It's partially because of the way they're made. Women and girls are more susceptible to infection. And then finally, the HIV rate in the United States among young people aged 13 to 24 has increased 3% in the last several years. The other thing that's increased is our teen pregnancy rate. We saw this wonderful decrease in teen pregnancy throughout the 90s, and in the last few years, we've seen this unfortunate upswing. And we're not sure why that's happened. We're not sure if it's a long-term trend. We're not sure if it's a, just a blip, but it's a problem. And really, we don't want our kids to end up here. We all want our kids to wait to have sex, to have healthy sexual lives, to not get pregnant before they're ready to parent. And since we're all parents, we know that no one is ever ready to be a parent. But in particular, it's challenging for teenagers. So listening to this and getting this, this information and thinking about these statistics, I know it's a little overwhelming, but there are great things you can do. So you can have a little Netherlands at your house where you can have an beautiful low rate of teen pregnancy, where your kids are not getting STDs, where they're healthy and happy and have wonderful sense of their own sexuality and they feel good about their choices as they move through life. So when I started this business, I actually had some anxiety for obvious reasons about starting a business talking to people about sex. But the other reason was because I realized I was really going to have to practice what I preach and I was going to have to talk to my kid consistently about sex. And I felt a little anxious about that. And it wasn't so much about the conversations, but more about what would the neighbors think and what would my parents think and what would my friends think if I was having these conversations with my kid. And I had a moment where I realized that my job as my kid's mom is to keep him healthy and safe. And talking about sexuality is all about health and safety. So it's about health in terms of pregnancy. Obviously, as I said before, we really don't want our kids to be getting pregnant before they're ready to be parents and are ready to handle that kind of situation. We certainly don't want them getting an STD. We definitely don't want them getting HIV, because last I checked, HIV eventually kills you. Pretty scary stuff. We also want our kids to understand how to have healthy relationships. We want them to know what healthy relationships look like. We want them to experience healthy relationships. So it's health and safety, and that's sort of physical health and emotional health. And finally, kids who have information about sex who understand that sex is not for children, that it's something to wait for, that's something for later in life, they're actually offered some protection from child sexual abuse. This is because pedophiles look for kids who are innocent, who don't have information about sexuality, who don't have open communication with their parents. 
So really, this is your job to talk to your kids. This is a parent's job to talk to their kids. And one of the things that makes this hard is what happened for us when we were kids, when we were learning about sex in our own families. So I'd like you guys to do me a favor, which is to stand up. So if you had open, consistent communication about sex, love, and relationships in your family when you were growing up, so you got lots of information about how the whole thing works, there's values conversations, you felt comfortable talking to your parents, your parents talked to you, or whoever was your caregiver, would you please remain standing? So lots of information remain standing, minimal information or no information, go ahead and have a seat. So shocking and kind of not shocking. Thanks. You can sit down. So is it any wonder we have trouble talking to our kids about sex? In our own families, our parents most of the time didn't do the greatest job. So we didn't have these really fabulous examples of how to talk to kids about sex. So I had a client tell me recently a very funny story about the one and only time her mom talked to her about sex. It was when she was in the fifth or sixth grade and she was doing the sex education class at school. And her mom said to her one day that the male and female genitalia are purely decorations that are only to be used at parties or for very, very special occasions. <laughs> so when we've got that quality of information coming down to us, or sometimes our parents gave us a book and said, let me know if you have any questions. Sometimes our parents did what I call a hit and run, where they sat us down when we were about 12. They told us all about our periods. They told us all about sex. They said, if you ever have any questions, please let me know. And we were thinking, yeah, right. Like, I'm going to talk to you about this. It's very common. And so one of the things that happens for us as parents now is that the way we were parented really impacts how we parent around sexuality. So I'd like you to take a few minutes and think about how you learned about sex, and in particular, what your reactions were when you learned about intercourse for the first time. Who told you? Was it your parent? Was it your older sibling? Was it some kid on the playground? And in particular, what did you think and feel? So what was that like for you? Was it a positive experience? Was it not? What happened for you in that moment? What were your reactions when you learned about sex and sexuality? I'm just going to jot this down. And we're actually going to come back to this later on, to this list. So, reactions? Go ahead. I was grossed out. Grossed out. I was really scared. Scared. Go ahead. Sounded very medical. Medical. Confused. Confused. Hilarious. Hilarious. <laughs> Anybody else? Embarrassed. Embarrassed. So, what do you notice about this list? Not very positive. Not very positive. Yeah. And I got to tell you, you all are a very typical bunch of parents. I make this list with just about every group of parents that I work with. And when we start out learning about sex, and it's really kind of a negative thing, we carry that along with us. This is really impactful. And so what I'm hoping you'll be able to do is to spend a little more time thinking about how you learned and maybe finding ways to leave this by the wayside because this really doesn't serve you anymore. We don't want our kids to be grossed out and scared about learning about sex. Of course, there's some medical stuff that's part of it, but there's also some psychological and emotional stuff that goes along with sexuality. And I also believe that 
when we take the time to look at our personal history, and this includes if you have an, a history of sexual abuse, we, it's really important that we take time to look at this and take care of that part of ourselves to seek counseling or therapy because, again, it makes it harder to talk about this the less we know about ourselves and the more conflicted, confused, and scared we've, and we've remained when it comes to this topic. So I know you're all wondering, what do your kids need to know by when? And this is one of those broad perspective moments. So again, I teach from a really broad perspective. So I'm going to give you a lot of information, and it's your job to decide what's going to work for you and your family. So I want you to take this information in, you're going to file it away, you're going to go home, you're going to come talk to your partner, whoever you're parenting with, you're going to come up with a plan for yourself and your own kids. So don't be surprised if you're surprised about what I have to say. But before we get into the details, one of the things I want to tell you is this. The sooner you start the conversations, the better. Because when our kids are really young, they're really under our thumbs, right? We know who their friends are. We know who their friends' parents are. We kind of overhear their conversations. We're really aware of what's happening for them when they're really little. But once they hit elementary school, things change. So one evening I got a phone call from a friend of mine and her daughter was in the first grade and she told me this little tale and she said that her daughter came home from after school care that day and she stood in front of the television, her parents were watching TV, she stood in front of the TV and she announced, I know what sex is. And her parents were shocked because they had never talked to her about sex. So they're sitting there and they said, uh, really, what is it? And she said, it's when people kiss with tongues. <laughs> and they said, ah, oh, rah, rah, hmm, um, where'd you hear that? And she said, from a third grader in the after school care program. So they're talking to each other and they're sharing information. Not every kid is talking to every other kid about sex, but they talk and kids hear things. It's really empowering for them to have the information before they need it. If their daughter had known what sex was and that girl had said, you know, it's when you kiss with tongues, she might have said, uh, not so much. You should probably talk to your parents about that because that's not what sex is. You know, in first grade, she probably wouldn't know that kissing with tongues can be part of sex, um, but that would come later on. So when we're thinking about this and we're figuring out what our kids need to know, one place I think it's really important to go is to our pediatricians. And the American Pediatric Association has this great list of what kids should know before puberty. So I just want to tell you, I'm nicer than they are. I think this is a list of things that kids should know before middle school. Because once kids get to middle school, all bets are off. They are up to everything, they hear everything, they talk about everything. Really no stone is unturned when it comes to sexuality and middle school. And you may remember that from your own middle school experience. Once kids get to middle school, all bets are off. They are up to everything. They hear everything. They talk about everything. Really, no stone is unturned when it comes to sexuality and middle school. And you may remember that from your own middle school experience. So the American Pediatric Association recommends that kids know the names and functions of male and female sex organs, what sexual intercourse is, and how females become pregnant what happens during puberty, and what the physical changes of puberty are. And girls need to know all about the physical changes of puberty for boys, and boys need to know all about girls. They also need to know about the nature and purpose of the menstrual cycle. They need to know about same-sex relationships and masturbation, how to prevent pregnancy, and also activities that spread sexually transmitted diseases, and in particular, HIV and AIDS. And the other thing they need to know is your expectations and values. There's one more thing I sh think should be added to this list, and that's how to be safe from sexual abuse and sexual predators. This is a conversation that should start when your kids are about two and continue until they are into and out of adolescence. So I think this list is really helpful because it gives us a stepping off point for these conversations. It breaks things down, and I'm going to break them down 
further because I think there's more information we need about what happens at each age and what's ideal for each age group in terms of learning about sexuality, love, and relationships. So the ideal time to start talking to your kids about sex really is about age five or six. So this is young, kindergarten. Like I said before, kids go off to school and they start getting information that didn't come from us. And when you think about a five or six year old and their perspective about sexuality, it's not the same as ours. So when we think about talking to a young kid, we're, and we think about talking about sex, we think about the whole thing, the whole kit and caboodle, we think about S-E-X, right? We think about the first time we had sex, the last time we had sex, how we're not getting enough sex, how we're having too much sex. We think about rape, we think about porn. There's all this stuff that comes to mind when we think about having a conversation about sex. And so it freaks us out. But the thing to remember about talking to a young kid is this, they're a blank slate. They don't know what we know about sex, love, and relationships, so they don't know to be freaked out. They don't know to be grossed out, scared, confused, embarrassed. They oftentimes think it's hilarious, so that's kind of unavoidable. In a lot of ways, it is hilarious, especially from that perspective. The standard reaction to a five-year-old when you say, you know, the penis goes in the vagina and the sperm and the egg and how the whole thing works is, and this is going to be shocking, oh. <laughs> they say, oh. They might say, did you do that? And then, of course, the appropriate answer is, oh, yes, but just twice, <laughs> or three times, or just the once. Of course, the answer is yes, if that's true for you. One of the things when we talk about this is that we need to talk about things like the usual way people become pregnant is this, because this, these days, people get pregnant in a lot of different ways. So the usual way is this, and talk about that. And I'm going to give you a little script about intercourse in just a little bit. And I think the thing that's also important to remember is that they this doesn't phase them. They learn about this like they learn about volcanoes or ponies or whatever because it's just information to them. The other thing is back to that safety piece. When kids have information about sex, they're safer from sexual abuse and sexual predators. And then another piece of talking to kids earlier rather than later is that they're not going to notice your anxiety at five or six like your 12-year-old is. So if you're if you have a book and you give it to your five or six year old and you're reading it together and you might be a little uh, nervous about it, your five year old's gonna look at you and go, huh, she's being kind of weird. Your 12 year old is gonna be like, okay, freak show, I'm not interested in talking to you because there's been a lot of time that's passed before you've had this conversation. Which isn't to say that you should not talk to your children later, it's just that you'll have more to cover. It is never too late to talk to your kids about sex. And when you're starting the conversations, the focus really should be on what I like to call a facts and science. So this is the stuff you really can't argue with me about that's related to sexuality. So it's body differences in birth and pregnancy, it's STDs, it's birth control, it's abortion, it's adoption, it's same-sex relationships. You cannot argue with me about the fact that women terminate their pregnancies, but we can have a long, drawn-out conversation about whether or not that's okay. So this is where that values piece comes in. And you also need to talk to your kids about oral and anal sex. But here's the good news. You don't start out the conversation with oral and anal sex with your young kid. You want to leave that towards the end of you know, elementary days before they start middle school because they need to know about this before they encounter it. It's empowering to kids to have this information. So all along, what you're doing is you're providing a definition, you're providing information, and then you're attaching your value to it. One other thing is that kids need to know about sexual abuse. They need to know what sexual abuse is. They need to hear those words. And you need to talk to them definitely by seven or eight and say those words to them. But before seven or eight, when it comes to sexual abuse, you need to be talking about safe touch, okay touch, that kind of thing. So you're kind of prepping them for this sort of ultimate sex abuse conversation. The other thing is kids need to know what pornography is. The average age a kid sees porn is 10. So what this means is that you need to get in the door and talk to them about pornography, tell them what it is before they're 10. So they have some skills and ability to handle it if it should come up for them. If they're surfing the web and they stumble across something, if they're at someone's house, that's our job to give them the information they need to manage those kinds of situations. So it's facts and values, facts and values. That's where you focus when kids are younger. So kids also need to know that most of the time, People have sex 
for fun. Now you may have forgotten that, that sex is fun. And so you need to think about that. When am I going to talk to my kid about sex for pleasure? So usually by the time you've introduced that intercourse conversation, so if you start with the five or six thing and you got the intercourse out of the way, if your kid knows how babies are made, by the time they're eight or nine, you need to fill them in that most of the time people have sex because it feels good to their grown-up bodies. And every single time you talk about sex with your younger kid, is you, you need to remind them that sex is not for kids. It's for later in life. It's for when they're in their early 30s. <laughs> I know, I just dream that that's going to happen for me and my family. I'm just thinking not. But again, you know, when we're, and I'm lighthearted about this because sex is fun and this doesn't need to be a scary conversation. It's a series of short and sweet conversations with your kids and we'll talk more in a few minutes about how to have those conversations. So I want to give you an example of how to talk to a young kid about intercourse, because I think this is one of the things that really gives parents pause. So you can say something like this. So when people want to make a baby, what happens is, the, usually, this is what usually happens, the man and the woman's body gets very close together and the man puts his penis in the woman's vagina. This is something they agree to do. This is not something kids ever do. It's not part of kid life. And the man has this little tiny thing called a sperm inside of his body, and the woman has a little tiny egg the size of a cell, not like a chicken egg, and the sperm finds the egg, and they connect together, and then they implant or stick in the woman's uterus. It's a special place in her body where a baby grows. And after about nine or 10 months, the baby's ready to be born, and this is really amazing because the mom's body knows how to push the baby out of her vagina. It's called labor for a reason, it's quite laborious, um, laborious. And sometimes the baby gets stuck or there's a problem and so women will have something called a cesarean section where the doctor will do some surgery and cut the woman's body open and take the baby out that way. And in our family, blah, 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 blah. However, whatever happened for you. So it's very simple and if you think about it, that only took me, what, a minute to explain? It's very factual gave a little values thing about this isn't for kids. And the interesting thing, again, is that kids will just be like, okay, whatever. Now, one of the things about this is, is that at about seven, the ugros factor kicks in. So a seven, eight, nine-year-old will say, ew, that is so gross. And then your response should always be, that is absolutely right, it's disgusting. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's totally natural for them to have that natural aversion, and which is nice, because kids shouldn't be having sex. And then that natural aversion is eventually going to go away as puberty kicks in, and they start having um, some sexual feelings themselves. And, you know, and as kids age, the actual focus of the conversation needs to change, and it goes from being this sort of facts and science focused conversations to being more about social and emotional stuff. So all you have to do is harken back to your days as an adolescent and you may recall how much time you spent fretting about, wondering about, thinking about boys, girls, dating, romance, and sex. The sexual stuff kind of fell by the wayside in some ways because the real concern was about relationships. So as your kids age, so we're talking like, you know, 10, 11, 12, you're gonna to continue to give them information about the factual stuff because they need to hear that over and over again. But you're gonna focus more on the social issues, like how to be in a relationship and talking about issues related to relationships like trust and respect and when it's okay for you to be dating. What are the rules for dating in your family? And talking about healthy relationships and talking about all those things that are so confusing and all those things that really serve us well as adults. So if you take a minute and imagine for yourself what your life would have been like if your parents had given you lots of information about sex and how that, all that stuff works, coupled with lots of information about dating and relationships and what healthy relationships look like, plus your values, their values, I'm thinking, you all are thinking, you probably would have done better in terms of your dating life and in terms of your decisions and choices around dating, relationships, and sex. So when you're having these conversations with your kids, I think it's actually helpful to know a little bit about who wants to hear about what from whom. So boys say that they want to learn about sex from their dads, and they want to hear about relationships from their moms. 
Now, not every family has a mom and a dad. Not every kid has two parents. Not every family is all set up like that. So when you're faced with a boy and you're only a single mom, find ways to have those conversations anyway. Your kid might be uncomfortable, but honestly, you just need to ignore that because it's more important they have the information. But if you have a close friend or they have an uncle or another male person in your life that you trust, make sure they have a couple conversations with them about sex if they're comfortable and confident to do that. Girls do not want to talk to their daddies about their periods. They want to talk to their moms about their periods. They don't mind if their dads know, but they really don't want to have conversations about periods with their fathers. So make sure your daughters, if you're in a single parent household and you're the only dad or in your two parent or two dad household, make sure your daughter has a book she can read about periods and then acknowledge the fact that you don't know much about this because you ain't got the right anatomy, but make sure you're open to that and again, have a female family member or friend that they can confide in if they need to. One of the things about talking to kids about sex is that sometimes we've heard that we should wait until our kids ask us and then we'll know they're ready to talk to us. This is a myth because it is our responsibility to talk to our own kids. So we need to be initiating the conversations, even if we're uncomfortable. And it's okay to acknowledge that you're uncomfortable, especially with your older kids, because they're gonna notice that you're being a little weird. And just say, I'm kind of uncomfortable talking about this, but it's really important to your health and safety that you understand about all this stuff related to sexuality. So one of the ways that you can do that is by talking to your kids in the car. They're in the car. They're behind you. You've got a captive audience. Mm -hmm. So they can't see you going sweating bullets and thinking, okay, here we go. I'm going to talk about tampons and <laughs> or whatever's on your mind. So it's safe to talk to them in the car and they'll listen to you. And the other thing about talking in the car is that it can be really short. One of the things about having these conversations is that it's not an hour and a half long, sit down, knock down, drag out talk. The sex talk days are totally over. Number one, I'm sure you don't want to stand around and talk about sex for an hour and a half. I might. I'm sure you don't want to do that. And your kid can't pay attention that long. It's boring to them. It's too much information for them. So here's the good news. Short and sweet conversations. So we're talking 200 one-minute conversations. My friend Julie Metzger, who runs a company called Great Conversations, that's what she says, 200 one-minute conversations. We can all do 200 one-minute conversations. So let's talk a bit about how to start these conversations, because this is another really daunting thing. So here's the deal. My sneaky trick is a thing called a book. Books are the easiest way to start conversations with your kids. So with your young kids, you can get a book. I've got a great list on birdsandbeesandkids.com. They're great books for kids about sex. Get a book, throw it in with a regular nightly reading, read it all yourself first because you want to know what's coming, and then just say, hey, here's a great book about how babies are made, and dive in. Kids love to read, and you're able to get away with that read with me trick until they're probably eight or nine, and at nine for sure, you're gonna to wanna to have a little bit different approach. And again, kids are not gonna feel ambushed by this because for those young kids, it's really about, it's just information, right? Just information. For the older kids, they're gonna be a little, maybe a little more like, oh my God, you've, you've gotta be kidding me. I'm not gonna read this with you. But offer and say, hey, I got this book about sex and how babies are made. Have you, do you know what sex is? and see what they say. And then say, you know, I, we can read this together, or you can look at it by yourself and make that offer, and then just follow their lead. When kids get to be 9, 10, 11, they start to really dig in about, sometimes, about sexual stuff, and they don't want to talk about it. And again, it's that natural aversion. So starting with books is a great place to start. Uh, with older kids, it's totally fair game to just say, hey, I realize we probably should have started talking about this sooner, but we really need to start talking about sex and relationships. It's a really important part of life, and I want you to be successful. So we're going to start talking about this. And you just deal with the reaction. They may say, no thanks, I don't want to talk to you. But honestly, kids do want to talk to us. They do want to hear from us. So even if your kid is texting, 
they're listening. They say they're listening. Even if they're distracted doing something else, they're still listening to us. And every kid needs a book about puberty and the changes of the body through puberty because they need a place to go that isn't a human being where they get this factual information. And really talking to kids is not so hard. In fact, the hardest conversation is the first conversation because you don't know what's going to happen. Are they going to throw up? Are they going to freak out? Are you going to throw up? Are you going to freak out? <laughs> You'll find out. You'll find out. Kids need to have these conversations and hear this information over and over and over again. And what's happening at home, what, the, what you're teaching them at home, should be supplemental to what they learn at school or at church or through other organizations. So they really need to be filled in before they have sex ed at school. Because again, it's empowering for them to already have the information rather than to be blindsided by this crazy news that someday someone's gonna maybe stick their penis in your vagina. I mean, really, this is not something that kids really embrace. And I think for obvious reasons, it, can, it sounds very, very strange, especially to younger kids. So. One thing I think it's important to know, too, is that they need this information over and over again. And there's a study called Talking with Kids About Tough Issues, and they asked parents, have you had a conversation about sexual intercourse with your child? And a big majority of these parents said, oh, yes, yes. And they also asked, have you had a conversation about HIV and AIDS with your kid? And these kids were 8 to 11. Same answer, oh, yes, yes, we've had this conversation. So, of course, they went and asked these kids, have you had a conversation with your parents about sexual intercourse? 39% of these kids had no recall of a conversation about sexual intercourse. 59% had no recall of a conversation about HIV and AIDS. So what we learn is that we've got to repeat ourselves or provide them with opportunities to relearn what they've already been taught. I'm actually a big fan of texting. You can text a little public service announcement. You can do that easily, and kids are texting all the time, and then the cool thing about texting a little public service announcement, like the best way not to get pregnant, is to <gasps> not have sex. <laughs> these little things we've got going on these days, texting, email, it's great because it's an easy way to communicate with kids. They don't like FaceTime all the time. They like to be able to talk to us but they don't always want to have a direct conversation. So texting, email, finding easy ways to talk to your kids. And frankly, it's easier for us too, right, if we don't have to stare them straight in the eye. So talk to your kids when you're doing an activity like washing the dishes. Look for teachable moments. So that's like when you're watching a movie and something comes up and you can say, hmm, they just met. They're making out like mad things. Hmm. <laughs> and you're just kind of, you know, dropping little ideas in their minds, because what we want them to do is develop their own morals and beliefs. And we can influence in this way that's kind of lighthearted and funny, but isn't overwhelming to them. And then we need to have more serious conversations, too. So we want to kind of do this combination of lighthearted and funny and then this more serious stuff. But always keep it short and sweet, because we don't want to exhaust them with this information. And you'll notice as your kids get older, they're going to want to have more conversations about relationships and dating and not necessarily with us. So one thing to do is to make sure your kids know who their safe adults are. So that's in my house, it's my me, my husband, my son's grand, grandmother, his auntie and his uncle. He knows he can talk to them. They're safe people for him to talk to. They share our values and I know that they won't steer him wrong. So make sure your kids are set up and prepared to have conversations, not necessarily with you, and that's okay. And for some of us, we aren't the people to have the conversations with our kids. So find someone who is. And if you're in a partnership with someone, if you're parenting with someone else, divide the labor. Maybe you are dating and relationships person and your spouse is all about STDs and pregnancy prevention. Or maybe you're both on the same page about waiting. Or maybe you have differing beliefs about that. It's okay to have differing beliefs in your family system because it helps kids, again, develop their own values. So as I've said, talking about your values to your kids is one of the most important things you can do for your children. It's actually the only thing that you can do for your kids that nobody else can. They can learn all about sex and sexuality from books and other resources, their friends, the internet. Not the best place to go for sex information, but definitely a place to go. But talking about your values is your job and your responsibility. And one of the ways I like to help parents clarify their values is to have you think a little bit about 
What does it mean when someone is ready for sex? Like what's happening that a person is really ready for sex? And I know I've been joking about it being 32, and that really is kind of true because at 32, people are mature and they can handle the ramifications of having a sexual relationship. So what I'd like you to do is just talk to me a little bit about what you think it means to be ready for sex. So, what do you think? When they're in a committed relationship, when they're ready to handle the risks and ramifications. Right, can handle the risks and ramifications, definitely. When it's not motivated by pressure. Yeah, no pressure. Pressure is really important, right? We don't want to see any pressure. And that pressure can be internal. I got to get this over with. It can be external. Their boyfriend or girlfriend is pressuring them or their friends are pressuring them. So pressure is really important. No pressure, definitely. Good communication with their partner. Yeah, communication is also key. You know, and as adults, we know that, right? The more, better, more and better communication you have, the better you do. Trust in the relationship. Definitely, trust in the relationship. Condoms and birth control. Yeah, definitely, right? Remember that statistic about how easy it is to become pregnant? If you're not using them, we all know that, right? Cool. They have a safe place. Yeah, safe place, definitely a safe place. So this is a way to talk to your kids about this because you can kind of use this as a checklist, right? Oh, have I talked about trust in a relationship? Have I talked about pressure, right, and consent? Have I talked about being in a committed relationship? And for some of us, the time that we're ready to have sex is when we're married, but that is not motivating for a teenager. 95% of Americans have sex before they get married. And you all were teenagers once upon a time, and maybe some of you waited and maybe some of you didn't. So it's very important to break down why marriage. And marriage has all those components, right, that we just listed out. It's not just being ready for sex. There's more to sex and relationships than just doing it, right? There's all the other stuff, the relationship stuff and the communication piece and all of that. So the more you talk to your kids about these different things, the more clear you are about what you believe about same-sex relationships, about abortion, about even when it's time to become a parent, about the small things and the big things, the more clear you are, the easier it is to talk to your kids about sex. And actually, this is the place I believe we should all start the conversation, is with our own values. the time to get some of your burning questions answered. So I know you have questions, so go ahead. So my question is, you gave us a script for young children to talk about intercourse. What is a corresponding script for young children to talk about sexual abuse? This is an excellent question. And so what I would say, just in terms of defining sexual abuse, what I would say is something like this. And your child, assume your child already knows what intercourse is. So you can say something like, sometimes people will touch children in a way that's sexual. And this can be called sexual abuse. It's never okay for an adult or an older child to touch you in a way that feels uncomfortable, to touch your privates, or to try to have sex with you. You should always tell me or another trustworthy adult, and you can, you know, who that is in your family, if this happens to you, you won't be in trouble. My job is to help you keep you safe and to protect you. So it sounds kind of scary, but sex is not for kids, and I want you to be safe, and I want you to know that it's okay to talk to me about this. So how often should we be having these conversations about sex? So here's the deal. When your kids are young, this is a conversation that you have fairly infrequently. So you're to looking at every few months, maybe, and just a teachable moment, like, oh, look, so-and-so is pregnant. Do you remember how people get pregnant? And the safety conversation should be happening really consistently, so reminders about safe touch and that sort of thing. As your kids get older, they're going to have more questions because they have more, infor more information. But they may not ask, so you need to initiate the conversation. So by the time your kids are in fourth, fifth grade, your frequency is going to increase to maybe every few weeks. And then as they get into adolescence, it's going to happen more frequently, like once a week. So you're going to notice you know, what your kids are doing, the things they're exposed to, and things are going to start popping into your head. So if something's up for you, talk about it. If it's popped into your head that you haven't had this conversation in a while, talk about it. So as your kids age, the conversations are going to be more frequent. So while they're young, you can keep, you know, you can do this sort of sporadically. 
So how do you draw your kids out? I'm, I'm having trouble getting my son to talk or reciprocate in the conversation. Yeah, and you know, that's actually pretty common. So some kids are super chatty and some kids won't talk about this at all. So remember, it's your responsibility to initiate these conversations. So even if your kid won't you know, reciprocate in the conversation, they're still listening to you and you can just acknowledge, hey, I know you might feel a little uncomfortable talking about this, but just say straight up, it's my job to make sure you're well informed. So I just need two minutes of your time and have your script ready, say what you need to say and move along. And remember in particular talking with boys, it's really helpful if you're involved in another activity. So playing basketball, washing the dishes, folding laundry, throw a little something in there. Don't worry if they don't respond. Their ears are open, even if their mouths are not. Yeah. In the back. What do I say when my daughter asks me what sexy is? That is the question of the age. You know, our culture is so sexual right now, and kids are watching this, and they hear that word sexy. So it is really important that they know what that means. So I'm really glad you asked this question. So kids need to know what intercourse is before they know what sexy means. So get that in. And then talk about sexy, and what sexy means is this. Sexy is about sexual attraction. At its core, it's about sexual attraction. Now, when you're an adult, sexy is about a whole bunch of other things, right? It's about being self-confident, being powerful, looking good, but at its core, it's about being sexually attractive. So you can say something like, sexy is a word that talks about how people are sexually attracted to each other. So if someone looks sexy, dress, dresses in a way that's sexually attractive, that can send a message that they're looking to have sex with someone. This is one of the reasons we don't say things like sexy little girls. Little girls have no business being sexy. So when they hear that, that sexy is about sexual attraction, that language pretty quickly drops out of their language. So give them other words, cute, attractive, pretty, beautiful other ways to say attractive that don't include sex. Go ahead. What's a good way to handle personal questions such as when's the first time you had sex? Every parent's nightmare. So here's the deal with that. You can respond to the question honestly and say I was 18 or 19 or 17 or 35 or it depends on you really it's really a personal values question. So you can also say something like, I, you know, when I look back and I think about when I first had sex, what I wish was that I had been older or wiser or in love or whatever. What they're really looking for is how old should I be? So you can also ask that. How old do you think a person should be when they have sex for the first time? So you really need to think about what you're comfortable revealing about yourself and think about also that no kid really wants to know about their parents' sex life. So there's another thing to kind of think of there, but you need to think about this and figure out what feels right to you. So I know we have one more question. How old should my child be uh, when I stop appearing in front of them naked? This is really a personal values question. So the short answer is, it's up to you. So in cultures where they have really low rates of teen pregnancy and that sort of thing and are very open about sexuality, those families are naked together from birth until death. So it doesn't really matter. If you're comfortable being naked in front of your child, that's totally fine. But you do need to take your cues from your kid. So if your kid says, woman, put your clothes on, put your clothes on. And as they age, you need to check in and say, are you okay with me to be naked in front of you? And for families who aren't naked families, that's also fine. But make sure your kids have opportunities to see non-sexualized images of adult naked bodies because they need to see what naked bodies look like. Kids do better when they understand that. And same with kids in naked families. So really, it's your choice. There doesn't appear to be any reason not to be naked in front of your children. So it's just your comfort level. We've covered a lot of information today, and I know you have more questions. And on my website, birdsandbeesandkids.com, there's a lot more information for you. There are resources, books for yourself, books for your kids, more video, and audio. One of the ways I like to end this conversation is actually by going back to this list of reactions and making a list that counteracts this stuff. And it's a list of our hopes. What are some of your hopes for your kids as a result of having these conversations? And also, what are some of your hopes for yourselves? So, who's got a hope? 
I hope my kids have healthy relationships. Healthy relationships. I hope my daughters are prepared to make safe, positive choices. Safe, positive choices. Go ahead. I hope my kids have correct information to share with their friends. Correct information. Uh, to open the door to uh, good communication with my kids. Good communication. I hope my son has high self-esteem. High self-esteem is a good one, huh? I hope that sex is an easy and comfortable topic for my family. Sex is an easy and comfortable topic, yeah. So, when you compare these two lists, what do you notice about this list of hopes? It's positive. Yeah, it's positive. I love to make this list because I think this list is really a list of our goals. Our goals are to, that our kids have the correct information, that they can go off and share with people, uh, that they have high self-esteem, that they have, make safe, positive choices, that they have healthy relationships. This feels so much better than this stuff. So I would strongly encourage you to hang out here in this list of hopes, this list of goals, when you're having that moment of anxiety and you're thinking, okay, here we go, I'm gonna tell my kid about intercourse, think about this stuff, focus on this stuff. Don't focus on the reactions, this old baggage. Leave that by the wayside. Spend your time here. This will give you the juice you need, the encouragement you need to move forward in these conversations that might feel difficult or challenging. And I have a hope for you. And my hope for you is that you'll be able to give your kids a gift. And that's a gift of a healthy sense of their own sexuality so that they can someday go out and share it with someone else when they're in their early 30s. <laughs>
help them understand the difference between a secret and a surprise. A surprise is something like a birthday present. A secret is sometimes something that kids feel yucky about. Another child might tell them they can't tell an adult. Your kid should know that if someone tells them they can't share a secret, that they need to tell you immediately. Make sure your kids know who their safe adults are. Oftentimes, kids will confide in someone that isn't their parent if they've been abused or they're having other problems in their lives. So make sure that they know who these safe adults are. At my house, it's me, daddy, grandma, auntie, and uncle. Finally, reassure your kids that if they have a problem like this, that someone's touched them in a way that feels inappropriate or scary or told them something that they need to tell you, make sure they understand that they will not get in trouble for talking to you about this. You want to be open and askable. And when it comes to sex and talking to kids about sex, this is hugely important. Kids who know about sex, who know it's not for kids, who have open communication with their parents about sexuality are actually offered some protection from child sexual abuse. If you'd like more tips for keeping your kids safe and more information about how to talk to your kids about sex, please visit my website, birdsandbeesandkids.com.